Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Andi Music with our live streaming concert number 33. Uh, today we have Catherine Needleman and Lachesar Kostov. Uh, we're going to sanitize the place down this afternoon, and tonight we have a jazz duo uh, with Warren Wolf on piano and Alison Bordome on vocals. Uh, and then on, uh, let me tell you about uh, on June 20th, we have soprano Katie Purcell and pianist Valerie Sue. They have, that's a program that includes works by Donizetti, Schumann, Mendelssohn, Strauss, Von Williams, and our own local Peter Dayton. Uh, you can go online to Andy Music Live. Dot com and you can check out the the whole schedule um, you're always welcome to donate or tell your friends to check out these uh, these streams which are available uh, for a week after after we present them live so uh, you don't have to miss these people anyone who missed this this morning can can go back and uh, and get a get a link to watch it at a later time I just want to say that our love and gratitude goes out to the protesters who are going to be here in Baltimore today. Everybody be safe, be well, be kind. Ladies and gentlemen, Catherine Needleman and Lachazar Kostov. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with Lachazar today. Uh, it's a very strange time to be putting on concerts, and uh, I'm really grateful to Lachazar for uh, joining me today across the stage. Uh, it's not the way we would normally play a show like this, um, but also a concert of oboe and cello is not something that would normally be done. Um, but the first piece we're going to play is actually originally composed for oboe and cello. It's not an arrangement at all, and I'm really grateful to the Brazilian composer, um, Mr. Ripper, for giving us a little video introduction, and we'll play right after that. Hello for Brazil. I am João Guilherme Ripper, composer of the Duo Sonatina for oboe and cello. I'm thrilled to know that it's going to be performed in Baltimore. It is not far from Rockville, Maryland, where I've lived for some years doing my doctor degree at Catholic University of America. I'd like to thank oboes Catherine Niedemann and Charles Lachezer Kostov to including the Duo Sonatina in their live streaming concert this coming Saturday. When I wrote it in 2006, my intention was to build a musical dialogue between the oboe and the cello in three contrasting movements. I hope you enjoyed the piece. Thank you very much.
So, thank you, Mr. Ripper, for that wonderful piece. Obrigado. <laughs> yeah, Lachazar will speak uh, Portuguese to him. I'm sorry, I don't speak Portuguese. <laughs> um, so, uh, next up, we are not playing an original piece for oboe and cello, um, but it's a series of arrangements of arrangements. So, um, Bela Bartok was one of the most important composers of the last century, um, but also he was very well known as sort of the first ethnomusicologist ever. Um, and of course, he was born in Hungary um, and lived through World War I in, the, in Europe, um, but came to the US uh, in the beginnings of World War II. Uh, and, he, and he died in New York, actually. Um, but one element that makes his music so special is his connection to Hungarian folk music. And um, as Western music last century began to sort of reach the end of its possibilities with harmony, um, Bartok uh, developed a, a significant appreciation for folk tunes um, for several reasons. One is a way to sort of develop a new language, but also to keep his publishers happy. He always needed something new. Um, so uh, in 1904, he started to transcribe um, folk melodies from peasants, uh, starting in Hungary. And um, here's a quote from him that I quite like. He said, another completely different factor that makes contemporary music, that means 20th century, uh, realistic, is that half consciously, half intentionally, it searches for impressions from that great reality of folk art, which encompasses everything. So um, you know, he started with the folk tunes of Hungary, but he expanded his explorations and transcriptions to Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Serbia, and to Turkish and Arabic countries as well. Um, and again, since there was not a tremendous amount of music for cello and oboe, we decided um, these would be good pieces to play because we like them, but also because they weren't original music to begin with. Um, you know, these are Bartok wrote down um, these peasant tunes. Um, and uh, he, they were duos for violins, actually. Um, they were written as a pedagogical tool. Um, he was, Bartok was also very invested in music education as well as history. Um, so of these 44 tunes, there are only two that are not transcriptions. And we are going to play those two. They are um, the bagpipe, which is the last one, and, and the Ruthenian, the Kolomeka. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Ruthenian Kolomeka. It's the last two movements that we're doing. Um, but he does such a good job incorporating this language um, that you can't really tell <laughs> which one is real and which one isn't. So here they are.
I hope nobody minds that Catherine and I started arranging pieces from the standard repertoire, and that is to say that there are very few original works for oboe and cello. If you have a French composer, I strongly urge you to maybe forward them this performance with some of the pieces that we ourselves arranged, but we would really love if there are more original works for cello and oboe, oboe and cello, excuse me. Um, because I think it's a, a rather striking um, ensemble in which both instruments have their great strengths as well as some weaknesses, of course, there's no perfect instrument, obviously. But the very fact that we are, I personally think that we're able to arrange something that is written for two really equal instruments, like two violins, I think it sounds as good on oboe and cello, uh, the Bartok Romanian dances. Now, I'm going to play a solo cello piece by the American composer George Crumb. Uh, the piece was written in 1959, 1955, excuse me, while uh, George Crumb was still a student. And as far as I understand, my teacher Norman Fisher told me that George Crumb himself is still very surprised that this early student piece of his has such a tremendous success and it's played literally around the world. I personally first heard it when I came to America uh, about 15 years ago and I remember hearing a performance of somebody and towards the end of the piece, it's about a nine minute piece, I said to myself, I know this piece from somewhere. And then later on when I started learning the piece, I realized that I didn't know the piece, but the composer wrote it in such a way that made me familiar with his language from beginning to the end. At the end of the piece, you knew that this is something that you've heard. And he does it by saturating the textures and the melodies and the harmonies with certain intervals that work like almost like tropes or like leitmotifs. In other words, he tells the listener, he tells the listener, you know what, I'm going to repeat something several times in different variations and in different juxtapositions and it's going to start making sense to you. In other words, don't be afraid of modern sounding uh, music. The piece is in three movements and I will play them almost quasi attacker as to sort of keep the shape that I believe the composer had in mind. One last thing is that I insisted when we were doing the program I, uh, when Catherine and I were speaking about the order, I said it would be really amazing if George Crumb follows Bartok, because as far as I understand, George Crumb and many other American and European composers at the time were incredibly influenced by Bartok, who was a towering figure, as Catherine mentioned, as somebody who, in fact, expanded the musical language by a lot. George Crumb, Sonata for Soul Cello. mute that I have to put.
that much about the next piece because uh, I met this wonderful composer, Alejandro Adgers, a few weeks ago um, when I was doing a project of a bunch of oboe solo music. Uh, and so she, I uh, had a conversation with her, which I'm going to share right after this. Um, but I'll just say, uh, because Lachazar and I are playing here without piano, we played uh, on the stage in February, which seems like a, a lifetime ago, a recital. And we had a great time with um, a pianist, uh, Victor Valkov that uh, Lachazar's worked with forever. And we decided, we were talking about when we were playing these concerts in February, that that's the perfect amount of people on stage three, because you know um, you still have uh, enough time to see everybody, and everybody can express their own thing, but it's a little more relaxing to have a few people on stage. And I will say, after just playing 11 solo oboe concerts, having another person on stage, even just two, is wonderful. Um, but this is from this project that I, I did um, at the beginning of the quarantine, the first 12 weeks of quarantine, um, of finding um, new oboe solo music that I didn't know. Um, I was trying to focus a bit on uh, sort of underrepresented composers in addition to um, some a, a Baroque work that I wanted to get all the way through. Anyway, this is one of my favorites that I came up with, uh, that I found. And uh, Alejandra is going to talk about her piece and why, um, why it relates to this program. This uh, conversation we made uh, happened a while ago. But it involves indigenous people, and it involves dance, which the rest of our program also enjoys. So, Semeliomi is a word uh, from a native uh, American uh, people. It's in the, the people that, that lives in the frontier between the United States and Mexico. It's the Raramuri people. And Semeliami means music to be dance. So okay. it was, well, the, the name I, I put it because when I wrote this piece, I had in mind two, two ideas or two images. Oh, yes. Uh, um, once, uh, one was like someone that starts like kind of meditating or very calm and then uh, if uh, the spirit or something starts uh, dancing and moving and dancing, making a, a dance and then returning to that uh, calm spirit. And the other image, it was more like the, uh, like the uh, snake charmer or something. So that we start playing and then the snake is coming out, then it dance and then it returns to the to the basket. Yeah, that's a very so, um, oboe sort of thing. Everybody thinks. Yes. Oh, snake charming. <laughs> yes. So that what well, I start the piece having those ideas. So for me it was a kind of a dance. Uh, so I when I found about this uh, name Semeliami, that is a piece meant to be dance or something like that. So I. I decided to, to put this title. Cool. And you're um, from Mexico originally? 
Yes, yes, I, I'm Mexican. Well, I was born in Mexico. When I um, finished my, st my wow. studies uh, in composition uh, in Mexico, then I came to Canada, to Montreal, to study a master degree, a PhD degree, and then I stay here. I, I have now my family here, so I'm Mexican-Canadian. Yeah. So now we have uh, two tangos by Piazzolla to close out the program. Did you want to talk about Piazzolla? Yeah. Okay. You know, it's interesting. Um, we started with an amazing original work by uh, Joaquim Ripper, uh, the Brazilian composer. And if you remember, the last movement of that was definitely a tango. 4-4, four, four, strong last beat, whatever it is. And now we're going to close this concert with uh, two arrangements of arguably the most celebrated tango composer, if there's such a thing, Astor Piazzolla. Obviously, he wrote other stuff as well, especially when he was a student uh, in Paris, started with Nadia Boulanger, who told him, you know what, your other music is no good. You should just write tangos all the time. So he did 
that I think he became sort of the father of the concert tango. In other words, this is music that is not necessarily, it, it has its origins in the dance tango, but it goes much further than that, you know, in, in its sense, it's pure instrumental music. We are doing two movements from um, Astro Piazzolla's Histoire de Tango or History of Tango. We're doing the middle two movements, Café 1930 and Bordello 1960. They were originally written for flute and guitar. And so we, at least we are faithful with that, that we have one woodwind instrument and one string instrument. However, you know, both the flute and the guitar are a little bit, should, dare I say, a little bit more versatile. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, no, the guitar especially, uh, you know, I'm playing the role of the guitar. Uh, there's a lot of chords that I sort of have to arrange of, of, um, uh, of way of doing, but by doing so, we both realize that the pieces become slightly different. They become a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more subtle, if you will, and a little bit more mournful somehow. I don't know, the Cello Noble, when they play something soft, they play more soft and slow, they play, it sounds really good. Anyways, those are, first of all, uh, I want to say, I wanted to thank you to Catherine for inviting me today. Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, it's been a strange day for me, obviously, having to put clothes, concert clothes on and drive to... Uh, and it's his birthday. <laughs> it is my birthday, which I, it's, it's, it's great. But the thing is that uh, I'm extremely sort of aware of everything that we're losing right now in the world. And in, in, in little ways, us, we classical musicians, we can't perform for you. And, uh, we miss you, and I miss yeah. everybody. Hope, uh, yeah. hope the time when you're back here in this hall with us on a Saturday morning is sooner rather than later. Or the Markov or anywhere at Carnegie Hall. Anyways, thank you. Two tangos by Piazzolla.
Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. If you came, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was a pleasure to get to play a concert and hope to see you in real live person at some point, hopefully soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.